Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their starry host by the Spirit of his mouth. These words summarily and pungently state what's taught in the first chapter of Genesis. God created all things by his word and spirit. Immediately on the heels of verse 1, which says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we're told that the Spirit of God was there and was actively brooding or hovering over the surface of the waters, which carries the idea that the Spirit was powerfully maintaining and sustaining the work of his hands and poised to make the formless waste or void of the earthly wilderness, which at that time was submerged in water, a fit habitation for man. The same idea is stated about God at the end of the Torah in relation to the people of Israel. As a consequence of the fall in Genesis 3, mankind needed to be recreated or redeemed and reconstituted as his people, which God was pleased to do, beginning with the descendants of Jacob or the people of Israel. Accordingly, in Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 11, right after saying God made, established, and bought Israel through the redemptive acts of the Exodus, it is written, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them, he carried them on his pinions. In using the same cluster of Hebrew words in Deuteronomy 32 that were used in Genesis 1, the word hover in particular only being used in these two places in the Torah, a thematic link is established between these two texts, the one speaking of the original creation, the other of a new creation or redemption, and confirms that Genesis 1-2 is describing the Spirit's active involvement in creation as well as pointing to his involvement in the redemption or recreation of Israel as God's people. The idea that the Spirit of God was actively involved in creating and sustaining the world is pointedly stated elsewhere in the Old Testament. For example, Job 26.13 says, By his Spirit the heavens are adorned. And Psalm 104.30 says, You send forth your Spirit, and they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Even as Genesis 1 and other Old Testament passages speaks of God's Spirit as present and active in the work of creation, so it speaks of God creating all things by His Word. According to the Old Testament, God's Word is not a bare utterance or impersonal force. Involved in or back of God saying, Be, as in the statement, Let light be, is God's living and personal Word. This idea is seen, for example, in Genesis 3.8, where it's written that Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is the first theophany, or appearance of God in the Bible. And the subject of this theophany is the voice, or word, of the Lord God, the Kol Yahweh Elohim. It was God's word who walked in the garden. It was the footsteps of his word that were heard by Adam and Eve. In Genesis 15, we're told that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and spoke to him. The word here is not merely what was spoken to Abram, but the one who came and spoke to Abram, an idea that also occurs in 1 Samuel 15.10, 2 Samuel 7.4, and numerous other passages. In addition to the word appearing, speaking, and walking, the Old Testament also speaks of the word being sent by God and returning to him, after accomplishing his purpose, Isaiah 55, 11. A closely related way of expressing this idea is found in Proverbs 8, where instead of speaking of God creating all things by his word, it says that God created all things by his eternal wisdom. In fact, the words of Proverbs 8 are actually attributed to wisdom, who is therefore being portrayed as a person. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established. From the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, 
When he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundary so that the water would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Inasmuch as Genesis 1 and Proverbs 8 are talking about creation, the two are intertextually related and mutually informative. And since Proverbs 8 assigns to wisdom what Genesis 1 attributes to God's word, it follows that the word may be thought of along personal lines, which is indeed the case, as we've seen from several examples already. Well, in light of the teaching of Genesis 1, consistent with the rest of Scripture, all of which teaches that God created all things by His Spirit and His Word, or wisdom, both of whom are fully personal, it isn't surprising that in the same context, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis 1.26. Contextually, the cohortative, let us make, is best understood as a reference to God, His Word, and His Spirit, by whom He made heaven, earth, man, and all things. Interestingly, by way of fulfillment, this is followed in verse 27 by a threefold repetition of God creating man. God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Christians naturally have seen in all of this evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity. Every church father, whether before or after the Council of Nicaea, who cited Genesis 1, especially 126, to a man all saw it as a reference to the Father and His Word, or Son, or to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In opposition to this interpretation, Muslims and other anti-Trinitarian groups allege that Christians are guilty of anachronism, reading back into the Old Testament ideas that are foreign to it and rejected by Jews. However, as already seen, this interpretation is perfectly at home in the immediate and broader context of the Hebrew Bible. Moreover, when anti-Trinitarians say Jews reject this interpretation, what they're really saying is that post-Christian Talmudic and medieval rabbis reject it. The fact is, while later unbelieving Jews adopted a hostile stance to this idea after the coming of Christ, earlier Jews, Jews during the Second Temple period, interpreted Genesis 1 and other passages I mentioned already in a way that perfectly comports with a Trinitarian understanding. An example of how many earlier Jews interpreted the phenomena of Genesis 1 is reflected in the Aramaic Targums, or Jewish paraphrases of the Hebrew Bible. In contrast to anti-Trinitarians who ordinarily think of the spirit as an impersonal force or wind or breath, the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan and the Jerusalem Targum both interpret Genesis 1-2 to mean the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. In other words, the spirit isn't merely a breath or wind, but is himself the one who breathed upon the waters, an idea that mirrors Genesis 2, where God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It also agrees with Job 33.4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So both the Old Testament and the Jewish Targums identify the Spirit as personal and active in the creation of man and the world. Likewise, when Deuteronomy 32 picks up on the language of Genesis 1-2, speaking of God as like an eagle hovering over its young, the Targums attribute this activity to God's Shekinah, a title often used for God's Spirit. When it comes to the saying in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, the Jerusalem Targum says, the word or memra of the Lord created man in his likeness, in the likeness of the presence of the Lord he created him. In other words, the Jewish Targumim viewed the us and our of Genesis as involving the Lord and his memra, his word. As here, 
Other Targumic renderings make it clear that the word is a cognomen or title for a divine person who is active in the creation of the world, who is also the Redeemer and Savior of his people. In Targum Neophyte on Genesis 28, Jacob is interpreted as saying, If the word, Memra, of Yahweh will be my support and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothes to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the word of Yahweh shall be my God. In Deuteronomy 26, the Targum of Neophyte says, This day you have accepted the word of the Lord your God to be king over you, so that he may be for you a savior God. In Leviticus 26, the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan says, I will set the Shekinah of my glory among you, and my word shall not abhor you. But the glory of my Shekinah shall dwell among you, and my word shall be to you a redeeming God, and you shall be unto my name for a holy people. In Targum Pseudo-Jonathan on Genesis 3, it says that Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Memra, word of the Lord God, walking in the garden in the repose of the day. The fragmentary Targum says in Genesis 3, The word, Memra, of the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Behold, the world which I have created is manifest before me. How do you think that the place in the midst of which you are is not revealed before me? And again, in Exodus 3, the fragmentary Targum says, The word, Memra, of the Lord said to Moshe, He who spoke to the world, be, and it was, and who will speak to it, be, and it will be. And he said, Thus you shall speak to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me unto you. When we gather up all that the Old Testament and Jewish Targums say about God's word and spirit, there's nothing anachronistic about a Trinitarian interpretation of the Old Testament in general, or Genesis 1 in particular. A Trinitarian reading of Genesis 1 is both contextually driven and attested in the writings of ancient Jews. As Daniel Boyerin, an Orthodox Jew and scholar of Judaism, has pointed out in reference to the evidence of the Targums and other ancient Jewish writings, particularly with respect to God and His Word, the idea of a plurality of persons in the Godhead, while suppressed by later Jews, was in fact the dominant view among pre-Christian Jews. Although the official rabbinic theology suppressed all talk of the Memra, or Logos, by naming it the heresy of two powers in heaven, both before the rabbis and contemporaneously with them, there was a multitude of Jews in both Palestine and the Diaspora who held on to this version of monotheistic theology. And, as we've seen, the same thing can be said regarding the Spirit of God in the Targums. According to the Targumim, God's Word and Spirit are neither impersonal things nor creatures, but personal distinctions within the Godhead, who together with the Lord created all things. When anti-Trinitarians who are pre-committed to a Unitarian view of God say, the Jews believed this, or the Jews believed that. What they're really saying is, anti-Messianic, post-Christian Jews now believe or don't believe this or that. And because we agree with their later apostate understandings, we're going to read their views back into the Old Testament, all while hoping you won't notice when we charge you with anachronism. No doubt, in the comments section, some are going to claim that they've got an alternative, non-Trinitarian interpretation of Genesis 1.26 that does justice to the text and is superior to a Trinitarian understanding. So in the interest of being thorough, in the next video, I'll address the two most popular interpretations favored by anti-Trinitarians and show that they're neither better nor even viable.